Welcome to the very first PETA podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, and this is our inaugural show. Each week, we'll discuss animal rights and talk to PETA staff and other movers and shakers in the animal rights world for an inside look at the effort to free animals from exploitation. Today, I'll talk to PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk. But before I welcome Ingrid, let me just share a few things about PETA you probably didn't know. Well, did you know that PETA does more undercover investigations every year than any other animal protection group? Or that last year, PETA sent out more than a half million vegan starter kits in response to requests from consumers? Or that PETA's campaigns department organized 2,700 protests in 2017 alone? Or that PETA has affiliate offices in the UK, Germany, India, Australia, the Philippines, and other countries, and works on animal issues around the world? You can learn more about all that at PETA.org. And now for this podcast's first guest, my interview with PETA President Ingrid Newkirk. Hi, Ingrid, and thank you for being our first guest here on the PETA podcast. Thanks, Emil. Delighted to be with you. Let's get a few myths out of the way, because I know whenever anyone mentions you, talks about you, they bring these things up, you can't always be there next to them on their computers or their, their cell phones to say, to rebut any of these things. But let's just get some of these things, because they are myths. A explain what you meant by your often repeated statement, a, a dog is a pig, is a rat, is a boy. <laughs> yes, that's often taken out of context. And I'm always wary when someone says, oh, that was taken out of context, but I can give you the entire context. It was part of a sentence. And the sentence was, when it comes to feelings like hunger, pain, and thirst, a dog is a pig, is a rat, is a boy. And that, obviously, Emil, is a cut and dry, no question about it, biological truth, is that they all feel pain, they all get thirsty, um, they all get excited. Every single living being has feelings and interests and doesn't want to be summarily slaughtered for someone's sandwich or their shoe. So it doesn't really matter, is what I was saying, whether you know this individual or you care about them or you like them or you dislike them or you think they're ugly. What matters is when it comes to feelings, like hunger, pain, and thirst, a dog is a pig, is a rat, is a boy. Give them all respect and don't visit any needless cruelty on any of them. Recognize them for who they are. Uh, but Ingrid, there are your critics who say, well, wait a minute, if they're all feeling the same, aren't you putting that equivalent uh, sign next to each noun and saying they're, they're equal and I guess that's where your critics say, you know, get the, their dander gets, goes up and says, hey, wait, is that right? Is that really right? Oh, sure. Yes, and it is right. I mean, I'm against supremacism of all kinds. Uh, I don't care if it's race or it's gender or it's species or whatever it is. We need to get over ourselves. And just because some of us are at the top of the heap doesn't mean that we should crush and bully those we figure or we can treat as if they're beneath us or below us. And so in the same way that I might think my child is better than your child, or you might think your child is better than mine, the fact is, when it comes to feelings, they're all the same. And so it's not a competition. Um, sometimes we have to inconvenience ourselves by chucking old habits out the window if you come to think that you shouldn't spit on somebody because they're from another religion, you shouldn't eat a steak because it comes from another individual who didn't want to get into that slaughterhouse or on that transport truck or have his beak cut off or his uh, ears notched or whatever. But whatever it is, the fact is the fact. It's not me who's making it up. It's just a plain old biological fact that we learned in Biology 101, or we learned in Physiology or anything else, emotions, 
everybody has them, and we have to just face the fact that should inform how we behave when it comes to others. All right, so we we have the first myth. Uh, when people see this quote attributed to you, a dog is a pig, is a rat, is a boy, they can now come to this podcast and, and get your answer, your sincere answer as to why they shouldn't be concerned or why they should uh, see it for, for the statement for what it is and not for what they might imbue into the statement, uh, because there's been a lot of hateful things said uh, about you connected to that statement. Oh, yes. And, you know, a lot of hateful things are done to anyone who challenges the old-fashioned status quo. Um, you can just look back at what happened to somebody like my heroine is Sojourner Truth, who was a black woman. And she had, of course, that going two, two strikes against her there. And she would stand on a soapbox and she would say to white men who were in charge of everything, you know, how mean are you not to let me have my little half measure if you think that I'm less than you? How mean are you not to let me have my half measure full? And they set fire to her hotel. They threw mm. things at her. They yeah. jeered her. And we all know that throughout history that's happened to anybody who has said, Hang on a minute. I don't think we're behaving ethically. Have you ever thought these others that you're deriding or exploiting or putting down or whatever you're doing to them, they might be actually not so different from you? And that makes people very angry. All right. All right. So, Ingrid, thank you very much for clarifying that first myth. There are others. I got three others here. The second one is Is PETA really opposed? to keeping companion animals. I guess that comes up a lot. <laughs> That's another one of those bugaboos that I don't know where that came from, other than um, maybe I do, because we've always said, look, um, the pet industry, breeding animals so that you can have them in your home, pet shops, breeders, making profit out of puppy mills, that sort of thing is why we have this huge overpopulation of dogs and cats that has resulted in millions of them a year being dumped in animal shelters, or worse, dumped in the street or the desert or the woods. And somebody has to deal with that, and it's not the people who created them usually. They're the ones abandoning them, either at the shelter doorstep and more and more shelters are saying, we're not taking them in. We're full. Go away. So then they dump them somewhere else, or they just let them die, or they kill them badly. We see that all the time. So what our real position is, is do not ever um, subsidize a pet shop or a breeder, and don't breed animals yourself, because there are already all these homeless animals who need you if you can provide a decent home. So we always say, if you've got the love, the time, the patience, the money, because vet care isn't cheap these days, to take care of one dog or one cat, maybe you could take care of two. <laughs> maybe you could go down to your <laughs> shelter, right. get two, and they'll keep each other company when you're at the movies or work or school or wherever you are, because it's also a pretty lonely life to stare at a wall in an apartment for eight or nine or 10 hours a day, then have this blur of a human being come dash through the door, throw in something to eat or throw on some more clothes and go out. You know, they, these animals need you and they need your attention and your understanding and they need a real life. But yes, get two if you can. But please mm -hmm. don't breed any more because they're dying in the shelters or worse, they're dying on the street. Death by traffic. So that should uh, clear up uh, myth number two. Is Peter really opposed to keeping companion animals? Ingrid Newkirk says get two if you can. <laughs> yes. And if, if you've got more, if, <laughs> yes, if you've got more room, then go ahead and uh, never get too many. Don't become a hoarder. You know, cats, if you get a lot of cats together, they get upper respiratory problems. And um, so you don't want to overload and then start neglecting the needs of the individuals. And some 
just don't get along. So you have to look at the personalities. But if you've got the necessary um, criteria for being a good home, a loving home, and a permanent home, you know, don't five minutes from now say, oh, I just got my calling up papers. I'm in the army and I'm off to Afghanistan. Or I'm graduating school and I'm leaving now and going to Arizona from New York. Or you are in a no pet apartment, for example, and you get an eviction yeah. notice. Don't, you know, be responsible. It's got to be. An animal isn't just for five minutes. An animal lasts a long, long, many years. So you've got to be there for them. Okay, let's go on to myth number three, which has PETA ever thrown blood on fur coats? I guess that, that's <laughs> been, people see that in the news or they say it. it it's sort of like, uh, you know, they don't, I don't know where they attribute it to. They might have seen it on a joke site or something. I don't know. What do you think? Has PETA ever thrown blood on fur coat? No, unequivocally, we we have not, but we have done things that could be mistaken for that. So I'm not entirely sure I blame people for thinking we do. And as you say, you know, that's, uh, that story gets carried around and grows. It's sort of like the myth of the Doberman in the closet with the burglar's fingers in his mouth or something. <laughs> it's one of those myths. But no, what we've done is we don't use blood at all. I mean, that's just not what we do. But we have used washable red paint, and we've covered our own hands with it. People give us fur coats. Lots of people have a change of heart, and they decide they're going to get a tax deduction, for example. They send their coat in, or a relative dies. And they are left, they're bequeathed some furs from an elderly relative. They give them to us. We decorate them. And we may put slogans or stickers on them, or we may put a red paint on them and have people walk down the street in those coats. And the idea that somebody might do that to you, and I think people actually, not it's not a Peter thing, but I think people may have done that or thrown paint on people. But the idea that someone might probably deters some people from wearing their fur. I, it's not the reason you'd like them to not wear their fur. But um, yes, that, that's another myth. It, it, so it's not like an official thing where, you know, whenever a PETA person sees a fur, out comes, well, it's not blood, it's red paint, and it's washable. No, um, but that's, we only do that on our own uh, the coats that are given to us, and then our people will wear them to make a statement on the street. But what will come out, I hope, is we have to be the voices for the animals. They're, they're dead. They can't speak for themselves. Even when they were alive, maybe they were screaming in a trap. Nobody listened. The hunter, the trapper didn't listen. If they're in their cages, nobody's listening to them as they try to chew on the bars and circle around. So we have to be their voice. And so what will come out is a pamphlet or some words from a caring person's mouth. So that person may say, you are very beautiful. That coat ruins your look. How, do you know how the animals are killed, electrocuted, suffocated, whatever, for that coat? There is no kind way to turn animals into a fur jacket or coat or hat or pom-pom or whatever they use them for. So, yes, people will speak to someone in a fur, I hope, a lot. A lot of people will be thinking something, and a lot of people will pull out one of our leaflets and hand it to someone and say, please read this. Don't wear that fur, please. So it's been effective. It's been very effective. Just recently, um, some of the old holdouts, like... Gucci and Michael Kors made the decision that they are no longer going to design fur. I mean, many, many, many retailers and design houses had already made that decision. But these are the old houses, you know, Gucci and so on. And so their announcement that fur is dead, which is basically our slogan, um, is is a wonderful thing. And now we've got um, some knitting stores that had been using Real fur to make little decorations on the top of hats and scarves. They've decided no. And every week we hear from a retailer or a mail order company that no, 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 we're not going to have fur. A lot of them, almost everybody now has, is shunning Angora, 
which comes, it's fur, mm -hmm. or you could call it wool right. from, from rabbits. And, uh, it's getting beyond that, Emil. You know, it's, it's now people thinking, I don't want real leather. I don't want to wear an animal skin. I'm not a survivalist. I don't want to look like a yeah. cave person. So it's, it's happening. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah. And as you say that, I am uh, breaking in my, uh, Doc Martin's vegan boots right now. No, no, no ad intended. I'm very conscious about that now, you know, vegan, vegan shoes, you know, vegan belts, vegan wallets, not using leather. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it's everywhere. Emil, it's absolutely everywhere. And these trendy, trendy, beautiful clothes that you can get that are pleather instead of leather, they now make, um, vegan leather out of wine, out of, mm -hmm. uh, tea leaves, out of pineapple. Technology is a fascinating thing. <laughs> you don't have to have the money to shop at Stella McCartney's anymore to get something phenomenal. You can get it on the high street. Okay. All right. So now we've cleared up the, uh, the blood on fur coats. It's actually red paint. It's washable. It's your own coats and it's very effective. All right. That's uh, the third myth. Let's go on to the fourth myth, which is what is PETA's stance on euthanasia? Uh, this is a little difficult. Because it, this is one that kind of divides a lot of people. They'll see things online. Peter gets a lot of criticism. Where is Ingrid, they say, when, you know, they've got something to say. They're mad. They're angry. So here, straight from, from you, what is Peter's stance on euthanasia? Well, euthanasia is necessary. And it's sometimes the kindest thing you can do if an animal is broken, um, in pain and suffering and aged, wrecked with cancer. Uh, all these things. And what we find, we have one shelter. It's in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, at the Sam Simon Center, which is our headquarters. And it abuts some very low-income areas of uh, North, uh, Northeast North Carolina and Lower Virginia. There's a lot of the people are still living in trailers and what have you. And almost everybody has uh, a dog chained out behind their home. These people often don't have a job. They don't have a good income. They don't have a car. And we are the people they call because we put our number out and we say, if your dog is suffering, we will euthanize your dog for nothing. If your dog is salvageable, to use a, a word, we will help you with veterinary care. If your dog needs to be sterilized, please stop having puppies. We provide, for example, free spays and neuters for any pit bull and for anybody on a low income or no income. So we've got four mobile veterinary clinics working nonstop. We have relationships with other veterinarians. But if that dog is not savable, if that dog is in terrible shape and the people cannot afford to go to a veterinarian, because again, veterinary fees are sometimes through the roof and they will just wait and that dog will be in, in deep pain. Then we will, um, do that for you for nothing. So unfortunately, uh, what's happening now is good people, a lot of good people hear the words no kill and they think who can be against that? But they need to think a little deeper. Because shelters are closing their doors. Shelters are afraid that someone will say, oh, that's a kill shelter. And so they don't euthanize anymore, any animals. And what happens is someone arrives with, and this happens all the time at our shelter. There's an old dog who is barely conscious in a blanket and the people are crying and they arrive and they don't have the money. And they've been to two shelters and been turned away. They've been on the phone saying, can anyone help us with our dog? She's got tumors all over her body. You know, she's septic. She lost her legs in a car accident, but she's still alive. And shelters say, no, we, we can't afford to take her in because people will call us a kill shelter. So mm -hmm. we call ourselves the shelter of last resort is if you can't find help, and you can't afford veterinary care, and your animal is suffering, we'll take the flack. You can come to the PETA shelter, and you can be with your animal, 
and see that they have a peaceful, painless release from this world. But of course, we also adopt, we also spay, we probably do more spaying than you could ever imagine. I think 13,000 animals we spayed or neutered in 2017, just on our clinics alone. So that's what it's about. But it seems to set up this idea, you mentioned no-kill, it seems to set up this artificial line that is really frustrating a lot of people who are trying to understand because like you're talking about the shelters that don't want to be a kill shelter. And, and yet the, the, what happens to the no kill shelters? They, if they don't adopt, they're essentially hoarding these animals, uh, with no hope or what happens to them? I, I, how do you, how do you address that? Because you'll get criticism for people who say, why don't you be a no kill? Uh, why don't you adopt a no-kill policy? That sounds humane. It would be the easiest thing in the world. All we would have to do is say no, go away to anybody who had a genuine need and an animal who is deeply in distress. And we would do what these no-kill shelters often do, I'm sorry to say. It's their prerogative. I mean, they're private. They can do what they want. But And, and if they place any animals, that's great. But we would have to do what they do, most of them, which is say... We're changing our hours. You can only bring an animal in from this time to this time. Mm. We we are full now because you instantly get full. I mean, it's a full house instantly because of there are so many animals. And so, no, we're full. So call us back in three or four months and see if we're not full then. Or we'll put you on a waiting list for six or eight mm. weeks. You know, someone who's leaving town or it's decided that they're going to, quote, get rid of their animal, it's not going to go on a waiting list for six to eight weeks. They're just going to dump the dog. And what we're seeing, and they also charge, we don't charge mm. anything, nothing. You, you don't have to give us a red cent if you need help for your animal. We're here for you. From dog houses to straw to flea prevention, we're here. But what is happening, and this is deeply disturbing, is every single day, without let up, Saturdays and Sundays and holidays included, I get emails on a list of animals who were left in a cage outside a shelter because the shelter said, we're full. And the, in this Arctic freeze, dogs who froze in those cages or froze tied to the door, Cats who are dumped in the parking lot, animals who are run over, a man who bludgeoned a dog to death with a hammer when he went to three shelters and was told, no, we can't take your dog. So this is the upshot, is bad death rather than no death. And what animals deserve, at least in this world, is a caring release from pain and suffering. So in answering the, the fourth myth that I had on my uh, agenda, what is PETA's stance on euthanasia? We get to really the harsh reality of what no kill shelters really do. So. Yeah. And, and Emil, I must add, I mean, one of the things that scares me to death is, I mean, there was a story. Oh, these shelters are so afraid of killing that they are giving out animals to absolutely anyone. And for years, we carefully came up with standards. I mean, you shouldn't just adopt children or animals to the first person who comes to your door and says, here's five bucks, can I take him home? You know, during the tsunami in Thailand, uh, there were so many orphans in institutions, and they didn't check, and pedophiles were going and taking the orphans out. We find that people with evil intentions are able to take animals out of shelters and cut them up. We have stories galore of people who have got animals on Craigslist, got animals from a no-kill shelter that didn't have standards, and just taken them home and attacked them with scissors, put them down the trash chute, I mean, mutilated them. There was a man just busted. Um, we offered a reward to catch him who had stabbed a dog 50 times and then stuck the dog in a suitcase. And thank goodness the police caught him. But mostly the animals who are mutilated and put in dumpsters or by the side of the road, the perpetrators aren't usually caught. So 
yeah, it's it's encouraging hoarding, it's encouraging abusers to adopt, and it's encouraging people to have more animals in their home in small cages, which is not a life, than they can cope with. Woman in Texas, the shelter was afraid, didn't want the reputation as a kill shelter. She had over a hundred cats that she had taken from the shelter that just went straight out of the door with her. They were all in carriers when her house caught fire and they all died with the plastic carrier melting around them. This is not the way to die. Right. Hence, we have the answer to my question, what is PETA's stance on euthanasia? It's almost necessary and often misrepresented. So, uh, Ingrid, thank you for clarifying that. You know, we had to get out some of these major issues that whenever you say, I'm going to talk to Ingrid Newkirk, it always comes up. They say, well, they always <laughs> ask about all these things I just asked you about within the last 20 minutes or so. And so now we've gotten that out of the way because it, it really clears up what something like three decades of misrepresentation by industries and other critics you know, who, who use animals and abuse animals. Oh, and you know, I'm glad you said that because there are really scurrilous players out there who try to divide the animal rights movement or the animal protection movement by trying to get people not to support what is now the strongest, largest movement for animals on, on earth. I mean, PETA is bigger for animal rights than any any other group. And this frightens people in the meat industry and the fur trade and so on in experimentation. And they form these little um, protective groups of each other. Um, I won't even give you the names but, <laughs> yeah. um, because I never like to promote them. But they're there and they're busy putting things out on the internet. They hire trolls. So if any lovely celebrity or someone does a good thing, here come the trolls who mm. are saying, oh, don't support PETA because they kill. And of course, it frightens people. And then they read rubbish and they think, oh, they do that. But it's all, it's all a plot in a way by meat people. And then it's good and well-intentioned people who don't realize they're being duped. And then, of course, there are people who are totally opposed to mercy killing of any kind, um, and that's just a religious thing, and, and that's the way that is. But they're in the minority. It, it's really trolls and well-intentioned, misled people who oppose it. It's also funny that it seems like you have your, your critics from both within and without the animal rights movement. Pete has gotten so big that there's a kind of jealousy sometimes, as well as you know people who are trying to be you know self-preservationist thinking in terms of the meat industry. So... It's not really uh, an enviable position where you're doing so well that you, you have so many detractors from every single angle coming at you. <laughs> well, it's all right, because you can shoot the messenger as long <laughs> as the message gets through. And the message is really getting through. You know, it's wonderful to see the news stories that say the surge in non-dairy milk, for example, is going into the billions mark. And you see every day some wonderful development. We've got, you know, the greatest show on earth, they call themselves. Mm -hmm. We call them <laughs> the cruelest show on earth. Went out of business, yeah. totally. Just today they announced they're going to have a walking with the dinosaurs like a Jurassic Park um, show instead. That's what we had been telling them for years. So they attacked us for saying that, for suggesting it. But now they're doing it. Yeah. And SeaWorld, you know, the animal abusement park can't, not allowed to uh, breed the orcas anymore. All this is progress. You go to the supermarket or the clothing store. Um, you, you know, you don't have to dissect in school anymore. So the message is getting through. And people are saying, I don't want to give to a health charity that still poisons monkeys or cuts mice up. I want to give to a health charity that's all about human health. And I just I rejoice every day to see how much is being done because people are clamoring for a humane world. They don't want animal abuse and they're being vocal about it. And the market is changing. Yeah. You know, and 
Peter's philosophy is the foundation of this. Uh, and now that I have you, I mean, it's one of the rare moments I get a chance to talk to you. Uh, but here you are. And, and for people who access this uh, at a later time, you, they can hear from you. Explain, <laughs> explain the foundation of PETA's philosophy. What does animal rights mean to you? Well, you know, it's funny. People will say, well, is this a violation of animal rights? Or is that allowed under animal rights? And I think we've made it very clear because our motto is animals are not ours. And then we say they're not ours to eat to wear, to experiment on, to use for entertainment, or to abuse in any way. But the foundation, of course, is we think of animals as we are animals. There are, we're animals, they're animals. We're all living beings, and we're all in this together, and we all need to try to be kind and decent to each other. So basically, Emil, it's the golden rule. Mm. It's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you put yourself in the place of that chimpanzee who's pounding on his cage in the laboratory, desperate to get out, going insane, or you put yourself in the place of the elephant who's shackled behind the big trop top, swaying back and forth, you know, so lonely and miserable, or the little mouse stuck in a glue trap because he's inconvenient and now his face is caught in glue and he's going to die badly. If you put yourself in any of those positions and you just say, would this be what I want to happen to me? Would this be okay to happen to me? And the answer is no, then that's an animal rights violation. So that's the crux of what animal rights is about. It's it's really pretty simple. And, and where were you when this this vision, this seed struck? I mean, because it can happen at any time in one's life, as a kid, a uh, teenager, as a young adult, as an older adult. When you first had this vision or this feeling that this, the, and it was seeded there, and then ultimately you found, found it and started PETA, when describe the progression, where were you at first? And then when you found it, Peter, what made you say we have to do this now? Well, I can, <laughs> I can remember growing up my whole life. When I came into the world, Emil, there was a dog there. His name was Shawnee and he was in my family before I was in my family. Mm. And so I grew up with this dog. I was an only child. And we were like brother and sister. I mean, we went everywhere together. He slept on my bed. I slept in his dog basket. <laughs> we went to see my grandmother and the, <laughs> we would go, we both got car sick. And so my mother would look back in the car and see both of us looking a little bit odd and she'd have to stop and we'd both get out. <laughs> but, um, you know, we had great fun together and I loved him and he loved me and he always knew when I was sad. I knew when he was sad and so on. But I, so I didn't really see this great divide. And I always worried. I don't like injustice, any kind of injustice. It gets my back up. I don't like mistreatment of, or bullying. Mm -hmm. I don't like oppression. I don't like any of this. But I grew up in a family where my father was basically eating his way through the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. I had a fur coat when I was 19. It was all very separate in what I thought about animals in the home, wildlife. I mean, you'd never tie a firecracker to a cat's tail or something or starve a horse. But we ate animals. We wore them. We buy th bought things, tested on them. One day, um, I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, mm. and it said, you know, this, there is a principle behind all oppression and discrimination. And that is that you see this other as vulnerable, as less than you, and so on. And that's where I really read something that resonated with me. And it talked about the French owning slaves and then freeing those slaves, human slaves, and talking about how it didn't matter about the um, 
whether they were intelligent or it didn't matter the color of their skin, it didn't matter if they had a language you understood, all that mattered was, did they suffer? And that was the common denominator that you should use to guide your behavior through life is be kind and realize if any individual suffers, don't be responsible for that suffering if you can help it. And that meant, obviously, the meat went out the window yeah. <laughs> and the fur coat went out the window and so on. So, so that's it, where the, it, it started. But it, you, you mentioned, did it suffer? Or did they suffer? It indicates feeling. Versus a lot of people say, well, did, did it have a face? I'm not going to eat it if it has a face. Because the face, I guess, is like, it's a, it's a yeah. real, it's a being. It's a, it's a, it's, it's not just a, you know, a distant entity. It's, it's something real. But did they suffer it really gets to the heart of it. It's feeling. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you just think about it for a moment and then you know it's indefensible to cause that suffering to any, other living being, because if you can prevent it, if you can not do it, they have a heart, you know, they have emotions, as we talked about, they have feelings, you, you burn me with a cigarette, I'm going to jump, you burn a, any animal, a cow or a rat or a dog with a cigarette, they're going to jump, it, it's unpleasant. There have been all these incredible, interesting studies about octopuses and, and fish feeling pain, because you said with a face. You know, a fish has a face, but somehow because he comes out of the water and has scales and doesn't have legs and arms that you can see, although he has fins, um, people just don't relate to fish very well. And yet fish are tender to their young. Uh, many of them um, will decorate their little area where they stay, they will have friends, they will have enemies. Yeah. If you have fish in a tank, which I don't recommend, right. they tell time, they know when you're coming to feed them and they go up to the top. But they also, um, they communicate. If you put a microphone in the water that's very sensitive, fish actually sound like birds chirping, they say. And I've listened to recordings online. Right. And the sound of the birds and the sounds of the fishes are almost indistinguishable. But one thing that I, I read in, in these studies that really upset me was that researchers gave some caustic substance that they smeared in the fish's mouths, mm -hmm. and the fish did everything they could to rub that out of their mouths, to spit it out of their mouths, to get away from it, to eat something so that it wouldn't be there. That's because they were in pain. There's no other explanation. So we, we see them in pain and we shouldn't ignore it. So for PETA, the foundation of PETA's philosophy, the organization we have both Shawnee the dog to thank and also Peter Singer. You're, <laughs> you're, you're reading Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, which is kind of the seminal book, right? Uh, it is. And, and it was very helpful to me because it makes the parallels of other movements throughout history. And um, it talks a lot about the principle that b should bind us as we try to be the kinds of people that we fancy ourselves to be, that we want to be, that we want to be on our deathbed looking back and thinking, well, I wasn't quiet when that injustice happened, or, well, I didn't do that horrible thing just because I could have made a buck by doing it. I mean, that's the kind of people we want to be. And animal rights fits in so beautifully to that because it is a movement about kindness, about justice, and about consideration and respect and rights for everybody who needs them, wants them, craves them, and should have them. Now, we've talked about a, a good deal. We even mentioned uh, Ringling Brothers. I remember the years before PETA, and I, I credit it with uh, introducing animal rights to America. Uh, PETA introduced and popularized the word vegan, for example. Uh, PETA launched the first campaign yes. against a Ringling Brothers Circus, as we mentioned. And this year, that institution closed. Uh, PETA did the first undercover investigation of an animal lab in the United States. So give us your perspective, given all those things and the things we've talked about so far in the podcast. What's your perspective 37 years after PETA was founded? Where do you see the movement 
I know that there every day there's a story of, uh, about some new breakthrough that that seems like that the the movement is where it should be and you know further along certainly than 37 years ago. But then there were stories that that, <laughs> that seem like oh no we are not a step forward we are we still have so long there's so much uh, more to go. What's your perspective after 37 years? Well, you're right on all those things, I think, because we don't have the luxury, if you will, of pursuing one single cruelty to one single animal and licking it. Um, it's that animals are, their, their use and abuse is really goes throughout society in almost every facet of it. I mean, you know, animal gelatin and what have you used to be on the back of postage stamps in tires. Now, animal bits are just in so much of, of what we use and, and, and so on. So, yeah, big mountain to climb, but we are certainly uh, on our way up it. We've got so much to do that I always beg people, don't be quiet, don't be silent, never be silent. <laughs> always say something because when you look at the gay rights movement, the women's movement, the disability movement, Nothing would have changed at all in history, civil rights, nothing, if people hadn't agitated. And if people hadn't said, hang on a minute, I know you've been doing that for a long time, but have you ever thought, or that isn't right, or could you leave that alone, or here's an alternative, why don't you try this, and helped people move along and help people think. So, yes, uh, I just the other couple of weeks ago, there was something about more tests in laboratories where they're using now discarded skin from human teeth to mm. grow a human brain <laughs> in a Petri dish. <laughs> That's oh. Now, you wouldn't have imagined that 37 years ago when the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing was just getting off the ground and we were arguing that you didn't have to test lipstick, eyeshadow, shampoo right. in animals' eyes and down their stomachs. And the people who made them were saying, oh, no, we definitely have to do that. We could never change that. You have to. And today, of course, we've got 2,500 companies that don't test, including some of the biggest. Almost nobody tests on animals. Um, unfortunately, in China, they still do. But uh, yes, everything is changing. And young people wouldn't be caught dead in fur. They want synthetics. They want cool stuff. You can go to the grocery store and buy any taste alike. The Beyond Burger mm. is beyond belief good. And if you crave the taste of meat, then the Beyond Burger will uh, satisfy that craving. And yet, there's no animal in it at all. So, progress, huge progress. You're right, but a long, long way to go because we look if you look at our website, peter.org, you see all these things that need to be changed. People are still killing donkeys mm -hmm. in Africa and China, yeah. uh, taking their skins and using them in, in snack ingredients. You know, there are things like that. Yeah. Well, all right. So the movement, you talked about how people should speak out, say something, if they see something. I guess that's sort of a phrase now that... You know, that's used to fight everything <laughs> yep. from animal abusers to terrorism. But PETA right now, it, right now we're, we're in the midst of this Me Too movement. That's another movement. You mentioned the women's movement. PETA is a women-led organization and, and has been from the start 37 years ago. Uh, in this time of revelations about sexual harassment, PETA is hardly ever, is never mentioned. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's very sensitive whenever one group is fighting to um, overcome some uh, horrible thing that's happened to them. It's very hard to get a different cause uh, or different aspect in there. I mean, you, if, if people are talking about children's rights, nobody really wants to hear about gay rights. They want to hear about children's rights if there's a big case or there's a movement. So I'm not worried about that. And of course, feminism should embrace the abuse uh, or, or reject the abuse of female animals. Um, but this isn't probably the time to start discussing it. 
Now you have to wait for things to cool down on one front and then say, and by the way, you know, what do you think happens with hens in egg laying? What happens with the poor mother cow who adores her baby and yet her baby is hauled off, uh, one leg tied to a chain to a tractor and she follows him with her eyes as he's taken away just so we can steal the milk and make ice cream and what have you out of it because we want it instead of allowing the calf to do what nature intended. These, there are huge feminist issues, which should actually, I mean, obviously concern everyone, not just women, within the animal rights movement. Um, but I think when you've got a sensitive issue on the table, uh, you don't want to sort of try to um, hijack it to another place. You wait for things to cool down. Mm. But has PETA as a woman-led organization, has that been a significant part of its success? Has it been a significant thing, you think, over the last 37 years? Well, I have mixed feelings about it. It's just a fact, you know, that mm. I'm a woman, although <laughs> in these gender-fluid times, who can tell? But <laughs> right. I'm a woman, <laughs> and we happen to have, I think, 80% of PETA is uh, run by, staffed by women. People in our top positions, um, most of them are women. Um, and so that's just how it's been. So there hasn't been a discrimination or sexual harassment or anything else within PETA. Um, and we've looked outside the organization and really we shake our heads sometimes and wonder what on earth is going on. It doesn't matter um, that I, we have wonderful men who work here too. And so everybody is united here at PETA by the idea that we want to see animals get a better deal in life and be treated with the respect they deserve. But it's been great. I've been collecting stories recently about various women um, raising their children in the office, taking their children to demonstrations because they were working mothers. And, and that was great to be part of that whole thing as we've been growing ourselves. Mm. All right. So let's talk about some of those specific animals. Let's talk about the elephants that Pete is concerned about. Ringling Brothers closed recently. The cause celeb has been uh, an elephant uh, named Nosy who went to a sanctuary. Now, who is Nosy? How did we get to the point that countries around the world and some communities in the U.S. are are banning wild animal acts. Tell me, let's begin with Nosy. Who is Nosy? Nosy is the dearest girl. She's um, several decades old, actually. And for many years since she was a baby and was taken away from her mother, she has been hauled around the country in the back of a truck and then chained up here and there and forced to give rides to children um, and adults by her owner. And this man, her owner, uh, Hugo Liebel, has resisted all efforts to um, have her retire to a sanctuary. She's partially lame, and we have a lot of video footage and f photographs of her. her she has um, at least one leg that is, is, is uh, unable to support her weight all the time. She also has this awful skin condition that he has failed to treat properly. And he's been cited over and over again by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But the USDA rarely takes any bold enforcement moves or even any sensible enforcement moves. So poor old Nosy has just been hauled from flea market to county fair and um, made to perform. She's very lonely. She hasn't known another elephant for many, many years. And she just has a man with a bullhook and a wife, his wife with a bullhook, um, taking in money for rides. So we had offered, you know, we, we were happy to look after Nosy to see to her retirement. But what happened was he went to this town, um, in the south and he chained her up behind a, um, an auto repair place and then put her in this old broken down trailer. Uh, while he went off somewhere and the animal control officer got complaints, came out, saw the conditions Nosy was living in, looked at her swaying back and forth, 
saw she didn't have enough food or water, and、uh, went and impounded her,、mm. which was a very wonderful and right thing to do. And the animal control officer went before a judge, and the judge said, "Sure, you can move her." So she was moved to the elephant sanctuary in Tennessee. It's actually called the Elephant Sanctuary, and they have a video. You can watch their elephants on video. They have a webcam at the Elephant Sanctuary. And they took her in. There was a hearing about a week ago, and the judge said,、um, "Yeah, they can have permanent custody of her. So she's under veterinary care. She's gained weight. She's on medication. Her skin is clearing up."、Mm. And it's all because people were keeping track of her and complaining and calling in. And on one particular night, they called the right person who took the right action. So that's nosy. Yeah, and and that's how we we get countries and communities like, like in the U.S. banning wild animal acts because of a simple thing like someone calling up and and actually getting lucky and getting the right person, right? It is. I mean, it's all up to the individual in the end, and that's why you have to, you know, be a squeaky wheel because you never know when you'll run into somebody who's ethical and who will do what needs to be done. All over the world, you're right. Countries are banning wild animal acts and circuses and denying them government land to set up shop on、um, if there's no ban. And in in the U.S. state by state, the bull hook, that nasty fireplace poker-like object with the metal hook on the end, is being banned. And you know the circus can't bring elephants to town if they can't beat them and hook them,、mm. because those elephants will realize that little person standing next to them can't <laughs> control them,、yeah. and they'll run away.、Uh, so. It's yeah. I think there's a new awareness that elephants don't belong in shackles. They don't belong standing on their heads to show that we can dominate them. That we are more powerful because we have weapons that we can intimidate them with. And so that's going away. We are working, Emil, in India, in Thailand,、yeah. in other places to stop elephant rides. And TripAdvisor is no longer. Uh, advertising these elephant rides because the lives of those elephants and the condition of their feet is absolutely、mm. awful. And、mm. the more tourists open their eyes, the more they won't patronize those things. All right. So we turn from hopefully, hopefully unemploying elephants because they shouldn't be employed <laughs> <laughs> to to bears. Now I read that PETA has rescued sixty seven bears. What were they rescued from, and why? Ah,、oh, well, you know, you're driving along, family with the kids, and you see these roadside signs that say、um, "Stop here, and you'll see the baby rattler," <laughs> whatever they say. <laughs>、yeah. um, these roadside zoos, which are really relics from the age before there were、uh, games to play on the internet and PlayStation and movies and television, there are these decrepit. Roadside zoos.、Mm. You pay an admission charge, and we say to people, "Please don't." But when you go in, if you go in, you see often bears who are in small concrete floored cages.、Uh, they don't have much of anything. Sometimes they don't have shade. They are often not even allowed to hibernate when the weather gets cold. They just have to stay out on this slab, which is completely. Wrong for their nature, and you see them turning in circles. Some of them get super fat because they have no exercise at all. Some of them get、uh, collapsed discs because they're looking up all the time at tourists going around、uh, above them,、um, throwing them food. But often their babies, their cubs, are taken away and they're sold for photo ops and this other rubbish.、Yeah. So we've been going around and closing down roadside zoos, and we have been getting bears out, ones who were trained to ride a unicycle or something when they were cubs, and we are sending them to these beautiful sanctuaries, like the one in Wildlife Sanctuary in Colorado, another one in Texas, where they have acres to roam, they have their own private pool, they get to know each other, they have fruits, vegetables, they hibernate. 
And it is just fabulous to see them become real bears again. It's just great. And, and Ingrid, what part did the, the late great uh, philanthropist, comic mind, uh, you know, and, and animal activist and animal lover, Sam Simon, what, what part did he have to play in all this? Oh, I loved Sam so much. I, he developed cancer and he died about three years ago. And it was an enormous loss. I, he was so smart. He was extremely funny, had a fabulous sense of humor. But more than that, he had a tremendous heart. He did a lot of work with veterans coming back from Iraq. And he paired up homeless dogs, trained the veteran and the dog together to be able to live and comfort each other and save each other. He started a spay clinic in Los Angeles and a program where he gives away, gave away, I think it still goes on actually, vegan food to families on a fixed income who are having a hard time making ends meet. And he always, I could call Sam up. And I could say, Sam, there's a racehorse who is on his last legs, and they're going to run him in this race, and we don't think he'll make it. We think he's going to collapse. And Sam would say, go and get him. And we had a case in California where we investigated a chinchilla farm, and this woman was electrocuting the chinchillas, which is extremely painful. It's like having a heart attack when you're fully conscious. And she would not tell people that she was electrocuting them. They would come to visit to look for one pet chinchilla. They didn't realize what happened to the others. Anyway, we busted that place and we closed it down and we, um, took, I think 400 and some chinchillas, over 400 chinchillas mm. away. And, um, Sam paid to have them removed to have the farm closed um and they all went to a wonderful shelter in san diego uh, where they were rehomed took them veterinary care and everything and sam paid for the whole thing he was just he was just lovely mm -hmm. he he paid for us to get a beaten elephant away from a fellow in india and get that elephant to a sanctuary too yeah but the bears specifically that was kind of a, a thing for that sam was part of right oh some of them yes not all of them but and of course, he's been gone now for three years, and we've carried on the program. Um, very hard to do so without him, but we're we're still rescuing bears. But Sam loved bears. Oh, Sam cared about all animals, but he had a soft spot for bears, mm -hmm. and he is one of the first people to back us up and give us some funding to move bears to Colorado. And he, in fact, when he was very ill, he went out to Colorado. He was walking with a stick with a cane. And he was quite frail, but he managed to get out there and watch the bears take their very yeah. first steps into this wonderful habitat. And it made him so happy. Yeah. All right. Elephants and bears aside, PETA also goes to bat for crayfish, lobsters, octopuses, and other animals who aren't well known. Why, why do you do that? Ingrid? Why? I think we need to get people to realize it's not just the cute ones. It's not just the furry ones. It's not just the ones in your home. It's all of them. Mm. And it, it, the time has passed to make fun of or mock animals just because you don't understand them or you've never known that particular species. So when we're armed with the information that these animals feel pain, uh, it may be that they're crayfish, and you mentioned crayfish. We just busted a dissection supply house, and they were actually injecting live crayfish uh, with latex while they were fully conscious. And you can only imagine that that's a terrible, terrible way to die while that creeps through your entire system. So they've been charged with cruelty to animals, and that's how it should be. It shouldn't be, oh, it's just a puppy. It should be, well, you cause needless pain, and the statute says you can't to any animal. And a crayfish in that state is an animal, not in all of them. Yeah, oh. Unfortunately, that time has yet to come. In Louisiana, do they count? Yeah, I doubt very much that they're covered under the statute. What you find, as I'm sure you know, is when statutes, criminal statutes are put together, 
industries rise up、mm. and they come to the legislature and they make sure that their particular interests are covered, which is why hunters have been trying to pass laws saying that hunting is a constitutionally protected、um, pastime and fishing is a constitutionally protected pastime. They do that because they know they haven't a leg to stand on if they argue that fish don't feel pain. Or deer don't feel pain if they've got a steel arrow going through their rump, you know. They, so they try to find some other way to exempt themselves from behaving decently and not causing pain to animals. But you're saying really that all animal rights is really all species, and humans are just one.、Uh, are they equal to us? That's what some people have a hurdle that they can't get over. Well, I don't think people should see it as so. Um, get defensive and feel challenged by this. You know, it's back to, in some ways, some animals are superior to this animal on the phone. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> I don't have an advanced sense of of hearing or an extraordinary sense of smell.、Yeah. You know, dogs nowadays.、Uh, there was just a drug bust case、um, where they a a dog could smell. Um, a little hard drive that was put in a metal box that was inside a steel cabinet, and the dog could figure it out. So there's often their senses are far better than us. They watch us. They figure things out. They don't build nuclear bombs. You know, they don't cause deforestation.、Yeah. So in some ways, they are <laughs> superior. But mostly, we're all a mixed bag. You know, a woman isn't equal to a man in some ways. But is superior to a man can probably take more pain than a man.、Um, so studies say. So I think we've got to stop this competitive nonsense. It's not you know the Redskins versus the Cowboys. It's their football teams. <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all inhabitants of the earth. It's a big orchestra. We play one instrument. Other animals play another instrument. And. We all just need to look out for each other if we can. Not not be afraid. Right, but we aren't the center of the world, Ingrid. Human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <that's, laughs> I think we have a lot to answer for, don't you, Emil? Oh I, yeah. I see the, you know, emigrants,、uh, emigrants coming across in these little flimsy boats to Europe, trying to escape oppression and drowning, and their kids drowning, and somebody selling them fake life vests. I mean. You know, we have a lot to answer for what we, what humans do to other humans, let alone what humans do to other animals. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, I have two more questions. I don't want to sort of go with the one light note and one that's more about what people can do.、Uh, the light note is we're coming up when we record this. It's during the Super Bowl or during the time of the Super Bowl preps, and Peta, of course, is going to have an ad. Or tell me about. You you are going to have an ad. Well, we're not going to have an ad running during the Super Bowl because they've quoted us the price of ten point five million dollars <laughs> to run it once. Ten point five million. <laughs> so,、um, <laughs> yeah, that would really、um, be rather hard to come up with,、um, unless anyone's listening.、Um, but <laughs> I think we we <laughs> thanks to the internet, this ad will go out everywhere, and then. In fact, People Magazine has has just called and that they're putting it in.、Um, it stars the wonderful, tall and handsome,、uh, dignified and and marvelously refined James Cromwell, who is also a peace activist, a human rights activist, a feminist, and an animal rights activist. And he is recreating his role as a priest, which I think he did in a television show, the name of which I can't remember.、Mm. Yeah. But he's a priest,、yeah. and he's in a confessional, and a man comes into the confessional and says, "You know, Father, forgive me for I have sinned." And he starts to tell him that,、uh, "Father, I am the person who came up with the phrase 'humane meat,' and I fooled all these millions of consumers who want to be kind to animals who think, 'Oh, but it's okay. I don't have to be vegan. I can buy.'" Humane meat, and he's the man is laughing. He says, "I fooled them all, Father. I fooled them all." And James Cromwell, he says, "What?" He says to James Cromwell, the priest, "What penance should I do?" 
uh, so that I can be absolved of this sin. And uh, Cromwell just looks at him through the little grid and just says something like, you know, there are some crimes, some sins that can't be forgiven. May God help you. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> and he's struck down? No, I guess he's not struck down. Or, <laughs> Maybe when he leaves the church, he'll be struck down. But, you know, it, it all goes to our campaign to wake people up to the fact we've been on so many factory farms that carry the humane meat label, and they're basically indistinguishable from the other filthy factory farms we've been on. Animals are still mutilated on them. Even when they say free range, if you go to the free range farms, what it means is hens have basically one square foot, which is the size of their body. That's all the space they have. And if they want to go outside, the doors, which are little hatches, are only in certain parts of the barn, are only open sometimes, not when it's cold, it's raining, it's winter, it's dark. So they're just a little time slot. If they can fight their way through thousands of other hens to get to that hatch and go outside, it's a barren little piece of land, not like the beautiful yeah. <laughs> green, lush meadow that's put, that's portrayed on the label for humane meat or, or, or uh, free range. So that commercial really addresses the fact, don't be fooled. The only humane meat means in vitro meat, taste alikes, all vegan so-called meats. Yeah. So uh, again, speaking out, Trying to correct uh, what, what in, in in reality is a fraud. This humane meat idea. So yeah, that's in the ad. A sham coming up in the I guess beginning with the Super Bowl, but I guess it'll be be just forever on the internet until until we get them to stop. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, fi <laughs> yes. Final question for you, Ingrid, and that is. It seems that this movement is about activism and has been for 37 years. What can people do uh, if they want to be a part, if they've been on the sidelines, if they've been quiet? Uh, what can they do? Where can they begin to be part of this activism? It, it all depends on people. And there's no need to be afraid to say something. It can be said politely. I wrote a book called Making Kind Choices, and that pretty much sums it up. In your own life, just find out what the things you do, how they impact animals. Because for every cruel choice that you find out you've been making, like buying something that's tested on animals or buying a, a, a shoe that's made of leather, these all mean animals are suffering. They all mean animals are dying badly. So for every cruel choice you've been making, maybe without even thinking about it, learn what the kind choice, the compassionate choice would be and choose those things instead. So that's easy. And then you get your family to come along, cook for them, provide them with vegan meals. They'll love them. Um, but also do see if you can put up a flyer, you can post something on social media, you can have a word with people and enlighten them. I'm forever grateful to everybody who told me anything, for example, about where my fur coat came from. When I was 19, I wish I had known I never would have bought it. So don't assume that people are going to reject what you say. They may just take it on board, think about it. But at every opportunity, we have to show that enough of us care because we do. It's only because people are silent that it's thought that we might be a minority, but kind people have never been a minority. They've just been quiet, and they need to not be quiet because when they speak up, things change. So buy videos, take people to uh, out to dinner if you can, to a vegan restaurant, yeah. to a vegan meal. Um, don't dissect. Talk to teachers. Talk to children. Do whatever you can do. Use our materials. It's all free for the taking. Peter.org is a wonderful resource. You know, Ingrid, some people might hear that and say, uh, you know, I'm just one person. Uh, I can't have that kind of impact. 
But maybe that person can. <laughs> you know, Nelson Mandela was one person. <laughs> Nelson Mandela was one person. Florence Nightingale was one person. I also wrote a book called One Can Make a Difference because one person can make an enormous difference. And that book is crammed full of people, um, not just in animal rights, but in getting glasses for um, people who couldn't afford them and uh, collecting things for people in other countries. They just started a tiny little thing and it grew. But if it only grows to your family or your friends or the people in your workplace, um, people you meet in, at a club or at a gym, um, you're doing something. Don't go to your grave thinking, I wish I could have changed the world because you honestly can change a part of it. You can make things better. Just one person is everything. And once again, the most important thing is just to start. So, and begin. Yes. And go forward. So, Ingrid, yeah. I I can't believe I, I've spoken to you for, this is probably the longest I've ever spoken to at one, at one time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we were on an airplane together, you know, cross country, maybe I, in between cat naps on the flight, I'd be able to talk to you from New York to Washington, or New York to San Francisco. <laughs> but anyway, it's been a pleasure Ingrid Newkirk, president, co-founder of PETA. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you to our listeners. And thanks again to Ingrid Newkirk, president and co-founder of PETA. Thanks to Carbon Works for supplying the music. Check out their videos on YouTube. And thank you for listening. For more information, go to PETA.org. And join us again next time... For the PETA Podcast, I'm Emil Guillermo.